My name is Dr. David Kreitzer and welcome to our podcast series. Today we're joined by Dr. Jonathan Bertram, uh, who is a physician affiliated with CAMH. He's in the addiction division uh, and he's also uh, somebody with great expertise in the field. He serves uh, as uh, the co-chair of the working group on cannabis use disorder guidelines for older adults as part of the Canadian Coalition for Seniors Mental Health Efforts. Uh, he's also a board member of the Ontario College of Family Physicians. Uh, and he's also in clinical practice like me. Welcome, Dr. Bertram. Hi, David. How are you? Good. Uh, there is lots going on with legalization, and there's a policy aspect to this, and there's an economic aspect to this, and there's a larger societal debate. But this is a podcast series for physicians by physicians. So let me ask you, as a clinician, what should we be thinking about? Well, um, I think probably the most important thing is what we might come across immediately. Uh, and acute intoxication is, is probably the, the most straightforward, but also um, perhaps the most prominent when it comes to headlines and presentations in the emergency. And tell us what an acute presentation might look like then. Sure. So, you know, acute intoxication with cannabis uh, can happen either because a person is naive to cannabis, naive to the potency of cannabis that they're using, or uh, maybe using more than they normally do, which is basically a variation of potency. And um, similar to what's happened in the States, what we anticipate potentially happening here, especially with retail cannabis, is that potency will increase and people will be using far more of the strong stuff uh, relative to what they're used to, or as a first time, far more than what they expected. And so they may come in uh, acute nausea, vomiting, um, increased paranoia, anxiety, uh, some of what you see with hyperemesis that I'll try and highlight a bit later. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, very much either very aware of the fact that it's associated with their cannabis use or maybe thinking that it's for some other reason. I'm a CAMH doctor doing a shift in the ED or perhaps like you, I'm working in an outpatient clinic. Describe to me the patient who walks through the door with an acute intoxication. It's, you know, it's probably someone whose vitals are, uh, you know, not entirely stable, uh, either with really, really high blood pressure or in some cases actually telling you that they feel real faint when they're about to get up, so that sort of postural hypotension uh, picture. Uh, somebody who's probably diaphoretic, so sweating quite a bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, confused by the fact that they're really nauseous and vomiting quite a bit uh, just because they probably expected that cannabis was going to be doing something different about that or, or sort of dealing with that. Uh, they might tell you that uh, they, uh, you know, had just tried cannabis for the first time or they tried something from the store because they wanted to see what it was like. Uh, or that they've been using cannabis for a while and they decided to go with something that seemed a little bit like what they you'd normally get from whomever it is that they get it from uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I just can't understand why it is that they're feeling this way. And in terms of a history one might take from a patient, what sort of questions one might ask? Well, I mean, the most important thing is getting just, you know, your typical sort of substance use history, which of course in this case would be a cannabis use history, and identifying if this is the first time that they've used cannabis or if they've used cannabis before how long they've been using cannabis for, um, and the means by which they were getting it, and also the means by which they were using it. Uh, while legalized cannabis is going to be available inhaled, uh, and we're really only looking to see different formulations maybe a year from now, uh, it's quite possible that they're mixing what it is that they get illicitly with what they were getting from the legalized store. And so the means by which they were using it would be important. In terms of treating the acute intoxicated state? So most of that is really symptomatic. So managing symptomatic presentations along the lines of nausea, vomiting. Uh, some of the intersection between acute intoxication with cannabis and cannabis hyperemesis is that, you know, we often use haloperidol and that would still be uh, reasonable in this type of a setting. But especially when we're talking about someone who's naive to cannabis use, uh, you know, really addressing, you know, if they're sweating, um, going with clonidine, uh, if they're, they're nauseous, vomiting, uh, something as simple as ginger, uh, and uh, that's available even as a formulary order in our, in our eMERGE and our hospital. Um, and in cases where, you know, they're, they're acutely anxious, um, especially if they've got a, a, a historical sort of issue with anxiety, then uh, what's used normally just as far as uh, short-acting benzodiazepines might be useful, again, in that very sort of acute presentation, short period stay in eMERGE or in an outpatient setting. Do you think we're likely to see more cannabis use disorder? I think that that is both a concern for um, the short term in ways that I, I don't think everyone uh, uh, anticipates and certainly in the long term, although there are lots of biases around that. 
Um, I think in the short term, it may be that people having availability or sorry, access to cannabis through different streams are now increasing their use of cannabis. Uh, the socialization of, of cannabis use is, you know, not a new phenomenon, so it's, it's not like it's suddenly going to become a cultural norm, uh, but, you know, the, the access of it in more frequent, frequent ways uh, may become a new phenomenon or certainly a more developed phenomenon. So there might be more normalization in terms of where you get it from. Uh, and so in that respect, uh, people who maybe previously were using cannabis on and off, maybe using it problematically but not in a use disorder sort of way, might begin to increase their use and by virtue of that develop a use disorder. And, and so you see somebody in an outpatient clinic and they're, they're not acutely intoxicated. What are some things you think should be highlighted on a history? The most important is what is very much, uh, I think, in line with uh, what was out there with the uh, College of Family Physicians of Canada's 2014 position document, which is people with mental health disorders are the people with whom we need to raise the most caution around cannabis use. And so establishing what their previous mental health history is is, is quite important especially because in many cases people may be thinking that that's in fact an indication for the use of cannabis. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, established anxiety disorders across the spectrum, established depressive disorders, uh, but also polysubstance. And in many cases people are feeling as if they are using cannabis in ways that are productive as a means of mitigating um, their uh, cravings, urges, anxiety related to other substance use. So getting a good idea of what their substance use history is is also important. Thinking about a patient I saw recently, she is panic disorder, she's really struggling. The sort of person who now has difficulty going to work even though historically she's highly functional, she comes to my office and explains, you know, cannabis helps. It's a difficult conversation because on the one hand, it does help, at least short term. On the other hand, we see it as part of the problem. What are some phrases or, or observations you've made to such patients that, that we could find helpful? So I get this question asked a lot by patients, in part because my practice is mixed. I work in Bowmanville two days a week in a community practice looking at chronic pain and addiction. So the question often is whether it's anxiety or whether it's pain, proofs in the pudding, I'm using marijuana and like I'm feeling better. Or someone else used it and they clearly are feeling sure. better. Sure. And I usually tell them, you know, what works and what you feel works is not the same thing as what's going to work long term. And so sustainability versus effect are two very, very different courses and they very much define or, or influence uh, what a person is going to decide to take. The other piece is, is when a person is using something therapeutically, they're actually far more likely to use more frequently and with greater intensity than they would recreationally. And so what they're at risk for actually starts to elevate because they're you know, exposing their system in ways that they normally wouldn't. What are some comments you've made to patients about reducing marijuana use, say with an anxiety disorder, a comorbid PTSD disorder? Yeah, so, so the main thing I try to emphasize is that um, tapering is not just a therapeutic exercise, it's a learning exercise, which is in and of itself therapeutic, of course. Uh, doesn't always feel therapeutic though when a person is feeling really anxious as they come down off of their dose. So what we try to look at is, you know, a just general principle. And a general principle I tend to employ with decreasing is 10%. So let's talk about how much you use, uh, whether that's, you know, how much you pay or what you think an ounce looks like for you, how much, how many joints it is that you're using. And uh, let's look at how we can decrease that either by 10% in terms of the amounts that you're using or 10% in terms of its frequency throughout the week. So if you're using two joints three times a day, seven days a week, well, you know, if you do the math on that quickly, that's more than 40 joints a week. So if we're at least coming down by four joints some total per week, we can manipulate the different times of the week that you're using in a decreased manner. And let's use that as an opportunity to see whether or not if that's closer to night, you're having trouble sleeping or difficulty with anxiety, or if that's a pain-related issue or an intersection with pain, increased pain. And then let's do quick follow-up to identify what it is that we can do. Let's also establish a way of addressing that so that you're coming to see me or you're seeking safe supports rather than going back to cannabis in order to deal with that sudden deficit. What I thought we might do is, again, try and cram a lot into one minute and it's meant to be a little bit fun. So let's try one minute of rapid fire questions and, and continue the conversation. Are we, are we ready? Let's go. Is this a big deal? It's a huge deal. Yeah, this is a game changer. Yes, absolutely. Um, what do you think we're going to see in an emergency department? More cannabis use, less cannabis use, neither? 
I think we'll see more cannabis use. Yeah. Are we going to see more cannabis use disorder as well? Most likely. Are we going to see other substances increased in terms of use disorder? Uh, absolutely, and I think we might even see more substance histories being discussed as a result of this. What's the biggest change you think we're going to notice in terms of a society that's legalized pot? Um, I think that we're probably going to see less stigma. Uh, that's a positive. Uh, but with that, we might sometimes see some misplaced confidence. What's the f biggest piece of advice you'd give to doctors uh, with legalization? Um, get the information. Uh, be willing to talk about cannabis. Cannabis is not the same as cannabis use disorder, but cannabis does come with both consequences uh, and obviously patient perceived benefits. What are you worried most about? Um, mainly the impact it's going to have on cannabis use disorder. And just one last question at the buzzer. Do you favor legalization, doctor? Um, I favor legalization with regulated distribution. Okay. Quick Takes with CAMH Education is a production of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. You can find links to the relevant content mentioned in the show, a video version of the episode, and accessible transcripts of all the episodes we produce online at porticonetwork.ca slash podcasts. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe. Until next time. Thank you.